I have the opportunity to introduce our guest speaker this morning. Uh, Abraham Jenkins uh, is, is joining us. Uh, he's a THM student at Dallas Theological Seminary. He has been gracious enough to accept our invitation to come and speak. Uh, he's solo today. His wife is on the way back from New Mexico. Is that correct? Uh, and she's coming back today, so he will be single no longer, uh, Lord willing. Uh, but without saying anything else, I'll let Abraham come up uh, and, and speak to us this morning. Right here? Yeah, in the middle. You're good. Good morning. So every morning when we get up, we have two choices. We can choose life or we can choose death. Now that sounds a little extreme, um, but most of the choices that we make, these life and death choices, they're so mundane we don't even notice them. Take driving, for example. I was listening to a podcast not too long ago, and uh, one of the co-hosts, had said, if you took a guy from like 300 years ago and you asked him to drive your route to work, like he would be terrified. I don't think you could do it. And it kind of makes sense when you stop and think about it. Like when you get on the interstate, you know, you're driving, you're merging, uh, you don't realize that you're in a multi-tonned encasement of metal hurtling down this narrow band of road. And then like what's worse, is that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of other people around you in their own metal encasements driving in ridiculous speeds to different destinations. And sometimes, you, if you think like this, you're like, wow, it's a marvel that no one's, no one's, you know, there's not mass death on the road every day. But the reason why this is is because an authority has imposed an order on the road. Now, this authority it regulates everything about driving. It regulates how fast you can go. It regulates how you get from one lane to the other. It even regulates how much distance you have to have between you and the car in front of you. And because of that, we all manage every day to get up, go to work, go back home, get where we want to go, at a pretty good pace, pretty good time, and most importantly, we all get there alive. But sometimes, when we're driving, this, this order can seem a little out of touch with our needs, with, what, with what's kind of going on on the ground. So just as an instance, um, as I said before, my, uh, I have relatives in New Mexico, and we go and visit them sometimes. It's not that long of a drive, it's like eight hours. And so you're driving across Texas, and Texas is a wonderful state. They have 75 mile an hour speed limits on their roads, which is lovely. Makes it so you can get there quite quick. Uh, but then, once you cross the state line into New Mexico, you go from 75 to 50. That's, that's ridiculous. It seems ridiculous, especially if you've been going 75. You slow down to 50, you're like, I, am I moving at all? What is going on? I feel like I'm going through glue. But you might be tempted, as I have been tempted on some occasions, to think, who actually like, makes this law? Is this, is this something I like, actually have followed? I feel like this was made back in like, the 60s and 70s, back before cars really could go the speed cars can go now. Like, you know, maybe if that's like a 67 Coronet, okay, yeah, that makes sense. You don't want that thing going faster than 50, but like, this is the modern day. And so you might be tempted as I may or may not have been, uh, to say, you know what, I'll slow down to 65 because that's a more reasonable speed. I'm not going to slow down to 50 because that's just ridiculous. But I'll, 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 slow, down, I'll slow down to 65. Um, and when I do that, when I decide to ignore the governing authority of the roads, um, I've imposed my own authority over them. I've suppressed that authority I said, I don't, I, don't, I don't want to abide by that, and I'm regulating my own speed. I'm regulating my own conduct on the road. 
And you know, you might think, okay, what's the big deal? It's 15 miles an hour over the speed limit, you know. Um, but there are, there are reasons why there are regulations on the road. Um, actually, a few weeks ago, uh, when I got offered to speak here, I uh, wanted to come out and see what the church was, so, you know, when I put it into my Google Maps, it always gives you an estimate, but it's like, is that like taking into traffic? So I just, I just wanted to drive it myself just to make sure I wasn't like late or didn't go to the wrong area. Um, and as I'm driving up here, I'm, I'm driving on the interstate, not quite in the left lane, but you know, the lane just adjacent to it. Uh, I'm looking ahead and about 200 yards in front of me around a corner of the interstate, I see a ploof of uh, smoke come up. And I'm like, dude, what is, what is, what is, what is that? And, uh, but I don't have long to think about it because all of the cars in front of me start slamming on their brakes. Um, I trying to not hit the guy in front of me and trying not to get hit, also hit my brakes, and we all eventually come to a stop. And uh, slowly, it seems something's over in the left lane, so people are migrating over into the right lanes to go around. And um, as, I, as I look and to see you know, what, what, what's going on, there is a, there's a, like four cars that are in an accident. Um, but it seems that one car was trying to like, get over into the left lane, and the other car whether or not they're using a blinker, or maybe the other person wants to make attention. Either way, there was some breakdown in, a, in order, and it caused a car accident. Now, thankfully, it looked like everyone was safe, which is you know, a miracle considering the speeds that people drive on Texas roads, uh, specifically in Dallas. But that can, there can be consequences for when we don't follow, when we, when we impose our own authority, we make ourselves the authority um, often, we place ourselves in authority over rules so that we can put ourselves first. Uh, in fact, the Bible tells us that this is what we do when we sin. We place our own authority over that of God's. And by doing so, we suppress the truth of his divine uh, power and majesty. Um, and just as there are consequences for not following safety regulations, you know, there's definitely consequences for not following, uh, for, for subverting God's authority for our own. Um, and that's what our text tells us today, is the wrath of God. Now, here's the problem. We are all, we have all sinned. We're all on this path of death, hurtling towards destruction. We have all suppressed the truth of God's divine nature and power and majesty, and subverted it with our own authority. So then the pertinent question comes, how do we get from this path of death over to the path of life? Our text today tells us we need to do this by clinging to the righteousness of God by faith. We need to cling to the righteousness of God by faith. Um, the Apostle Paul actually wrote about these two paths in uh, our text today, which is Romans 1, 16 through 32. Um, I'll, while you, I'll give you a second to turn there. I'll give you a little bit of just perspective wherever you're on the book. We're at the beginning. Uh, Paul has just finished his salutation to the church in Rome. Um, unlike most other epistles that Paul writes, you know, uh, he, doesn't, he didn't plant this church in Rome. In fact, tradition tells us that Peter planted the church in Rome. Um, and while he does know a few people there, he's, he, he, for the majority of people... I'd imagine, who go to the church are um, unknown to Paul. But he does give us a hint of what his main goal is. Um, and it's here at the end uh, in 15. Thus I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. That's Paul's main mission. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And so here, already in the text, Paul's given us an answer. He's revealed the path of life. The path of life is the righteousness of God. Everything that exists derives its existence from God. Every true, good, beautiful, and righteous thing has its base in him. It is from God that all life flows into us, and by his grace that we're sustained by it. Now, 
we are brought from the path of the dead to the path of the living by faith, by living by faith. Um, and to kind of get an insight to what Paul means here, what does that mean to live by faith, um, you got to look at what he's quoting. So in some Bibles, you'll see that the righteous shall live by faith is in this bold text, and that's to tell you that Paul is quoting from an Old Testament passage. And what he's quoting from is Habakkuk 2.4, where Habakkuk is living in the last days of the southern kingdom. The rulers of the southern kingdom are wicked. He, he cries out to God, says, they have abandoned your law, they're cruel, they're unjust, they're worshiping idols. What are you, Lord, this is your people. What are you going to do? Like, have you abandoned us? And then the Lord responds to him saying, oh, don't worry, Habakkuk. I have a plan to judge them. I'm sending the Babylonians to carry, them, to carry uh, all of Judea away. And as you can imagine, this is quite startling to Habakkuk. Because he says, Lord, the, the Babylonians are ten times worse. Like, if you think the, if you think the, the Hebrew leaders, or the Jewish leaders are leading unjustly, the, the Babylonians are ten times worse. They don't even pretend to give lip service to God. And so, at the end of chapter 1, Habakkuk is pretty much in despair. He's... But God responds to Habakkuk with a future promise. He says, there is a future promise. He says, I have not forgotten my people Israel. There's a future promise for them, an ultimate future salvation. The righteous remnant will live by faith, by trusting in this ultimate future salvation. The gospel is the power of this salvation. The righteousness of God, which each person needs in their life because of their sin, um, does not come through any person's work, but comes through the grace through faith in Jesus, who is the perfect atonement for sin and redemption for all who believe. So Paul here is saying, if we believe in Jesus, if we believe in the gospel, what he's so excited to preach, why he's coming to Rome, then we have the answer to the question of life and death. That is how you get onto the path of life. You believe in Christ and are afforded his alien righteousness. You are identified with Christ. Paul here is saying that we need to live our lives by placing our trust in Christ and live as if he is our king. So Paul is saying, I know... We're living in a pagan world. But we need, if you believe in Christ, to live as if you're living under Christ, as if he's already reigning. The gospel says because it's the righteousness of God revealed. This is the righteousness, uh, this righteousness is then given to those who have faith that they might live. This life is through God because God is the creator and sustainer of all things. He holds everything together. In fact, if the entire universe were the solar system, God would be the sun. All other created things would be the planets in orbit. He gives the planets guidance. He gives them direction. He gives them light, heat, warmth, and life. He holds them all in together. If you were to replace that sun with any other planet in the solar system, or if you were to remove it entirely, all of the planets would shatter what would uh, shoot out into the depths of space. Instead of light, there'd be darkness. And whatever was put in the place of the sun would be terribly warped and destroyed by the gravitational forces. This is how we are when we're outside of God's righteousness. If God is one who created and sustained everything, if he is not at our center, if we replace him with ourselves, then instead of the light giving life, we will get darkness and destruction. And Paul actually speaks about this in, his, in the next verses, in 18 through 20, if you'll read with me. For the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who, by their unrighteousness, suppress the truth. For what can be known about, uh, what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. 
For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So we are without, or so they are without excuse. So just as before, we had the path of life revealed by Paul. Now he's going and he's revealing the path of death, which is right here. Paul tells us that we all know God. Everyone knows him. We can all see his divine power and majesty evident in the created things of the world. Therefore, whenever we suppress, whenever we supplant that authority, whenever we, whenever we go against his authority, his will, we suppress that truth for a lie that, that you know, whatever justification it is, that we decide that we can be the masters of our fate. So what does that mean? How do you suppress the truth of God for a lie? Well, then he, Paul is to our rescue again because he, he lays it out in 21 through 23. Uh, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the images of birds and animals and creeping things and mortal men. So though they knew God, they knew he was the creator and sustainer of all things. But instead of honoring God and giving thanks to God, they replaced him from the center of their world with creatures. They they replaced the creator with the creature. And that is what we do every time we sin. We tell God, I know better. We suppress the truth that God is the creator and ruler, and we replace him in our hearts with an idol of ourselves. All sin is an attack on the majesty of God and a violation of God's just order. When we lie, when we hate, when we cheat, whenever we place our needs and our comforts first, we suppress the truth that God is God. We don't live as if God is God. As a result, mankind, all of humanity, becomes enfeebled. And let me tell you what I mean by this. So back in Genesis... When God first creates everything, creates all of creation, the planets, the land, the animals, the sea, the birds. And then at the pinnacle of creation is man. And man was given the the honor, the glory of being God's image bearer on earth and being the steward over all creation. So man was to have dominion over all creation and steward creation and be God's personal representative to creation. But instead of doing that, what humanity did is that we saw where God was and we said, I want to be like God. In fact, those are the words that the serpent used to tempt um, Adam and Eve. And because of that, man supplanted the authority of God with their own authority. They suppressed the authority of God and replaced it with their own. And then as a result, what happens. I mean, you look at any ancient civilization, you look at their religions, right? They're, they're worshipping, you know, at best, they're worshipping superhumans, right? People, you know, men plus. Um, and at worst, they're, they're worshipping cows, like barnyard animals. I don't know if any of you guys have ever seen a cow or ever been to a, a, a farm, but you, you have a cow and then you have the image of the immortal god. And so now you have man, he's taken, and he's placed himself under the created things as a servant to them, to something that he should have been over. And man has become so enfeebled that he's unable to see that these things, the things that he worships, whether it's things in nature, whether it's animals, all point back to God. This is true of us. Every time we disregard the truth of God, Uh, We degenerate because of it. Um, In fact, Paul speaks this in 24 and 25. Therefore, God gave them up to the lusts of their hearts to, uh, to impurity, to dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth of the immortal God for a lie and worshiped the creature rather than creator, who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. Sin corrupts and destroys our bodies, minds, and souls. So then what happens when we take the creator of the world, the sustainer, the one who holds everything together, 
when we say we are wiser, we know better, when we abandon the one who sustains our existence and who holds us together, in whose image we are crafted. Well, Paul tells us, he says, we become fools, futile in our thinking, and our foolish hearts are darkened. And God lifts his hand up, which shields us from the degenerating effects of sin. So what does that look like? Well, Paul gives us a good example in the next passage. Uh, sin is an, infected, is an infection, a wound that we've all carried with us from our births. Stretching all the way back to Adam, and the longer it goes untreated, the worse it gets, and the greater it grows within us until you are completely consumed. Sin's goal is to twist and destroy everything it touches, corrupting it until it's a complete parody of itself, ending in death. In fact, Paul uses uh, homosexual relations as an analogy for this. So if you think about what intimate relations are supposed to be for, right? It's supposed to be between uh, a husband and a wife for the purpose of procreation. And yet, in homosexual relations, we have two people of the same gender, and there's no possibility of uh, life coming. The facade of the, of the institution it remains the same, but it has completely been hollowed out. It's the antithesis of what the act was designed for. Um, I don't know if anybody here has seen a movie called Weekend at Bernie's, or if they're familiar with it, but the idea is there's a, a guy, Bernie, um, and he is, he's no longer, he's dead. And there are people who are pretending he's alive. You know, they're walking around with him pretending he's alive. Um, that's, kind of, that's kind of what sometimes sin does to things, right? It puppets around the corpse of whatever it is. It can do what it did in life, but it's still a corpse. Inside there's no life, but there's death. And then, so Paul's not saying homosexuality is a special case of sin. So I'm saying, well, this is this bad thing over here. He's saying all sin does this to everything it touches. Um, all corruption happens because we suppress the truth. And the more we suppress the truth, the more callous our hearts grow to sin because our soul is slowly being destroyed by sin. And we lose the ability to see good or recognize evil. So there's a great quote by a Puritan theologian named uh, John Owens. Um, he wrote on the nature of sin. He said, sin always aims for the uttermost. Every time it rises, or te- every time it rises up to tempt or entice, might it have its own course, it would go out and be the uttermost sin in that kind. So every clean thought or glance would be adultery. Every covetous desire would be oppression. Every thought of unbelief would be atheism. Might it be allowed to grow to its head? I love fiction. Ironically, in fiction, you can portray the truths about the world in a more clear way than you can in reality sometimes. Um, There's a famous book series called Lord of the Rings, and if you're not familiar with it, you should watch it. But also, or read the book, any sort of interaction will be fine. But there's this Dark Lord Sauron. He is, you know, the leader of all the forces in evil in Middle Earth. And he's created a ring. And into his ring he's poured like all sorts, all of his power. But he loses it at some point, and it comes into the, the possession of our protagonist, Frodo. Uh, and Frodo, with his company of people, end up going to the mountain where it was created, the only place where it can be destroyed, and throwing it in. And um, it's a great story. That's a horrible summary. But for purposes of today, that'll suffice. Um, The question, though, I've always had is, like, when Frodo and Sam get to the top of the mountain, this is like the entrance into the top of the volcano, there's no one guarding it. And I've always thought, if there's one place where where you could be destroyed forever, why not, like, put, I don't know, thousands of orcs there? Like, you've got the numbers. Um, but apparently, I'm not the only one who thought this, because someone wrote Tolkien way back in the, in the 50s and 60s about it. And what, his response was really interesting, and gives us insight to our question today. He said that Sauron had become so evil, he'd gone down the path of evil for so long, that he was no longer able to recognize 
good. He wasn't able to see things from the good point of view. He could never fathom someone having something as powerful as the ring and then wanting to destroy it. He was incapable of seeing things from the good perspective. If you want something from real history, um, you only need to look back 80 years to 1930s Germany. Um, when Hitler rose to power, he said his, his purported goals was to establish a 10,000 year empire for the German people and to make sure that the German people prospered and flourished. Uh, but you fast forward just a few years to 1944, you have the Soviets coming in from the east, you have the Allies coming from the north, and then recently you have the Allies landing at Normandy. Now, there's a few things he could have done at this point. He could have made peace. He could have put everything they had into the war effort, maybe stopping the invasions at Normandy. But instead, what they did was they took vital, at a time when men and munitions are at a premium, they took the trains and they loaded up all the Jews that they had in France and tried to ship them back to Germany as fast as possible so they could eradicate them all. They diverted all train traffic around these trains so these trains could go nonstop, depriving the front of vital munitions and manpower. In fact, somebody did a study and they said that um, during uh, the operations when they were invading the Soviet Union, 10% of the Army's entire logistical uh, needs could have been fulfilled by the trains that they were using every day all the, for um, deporting Jews to concentration camps. Hitler would end up leading his country into death. Germany would be conquered one square acre at a time. Uh, and if you go to any major German city today, there's hardly a building that's older than 1945 because of all the bombing. Germany would be, end up splitting into two countries, and over 80 million Germans were dead. It's quite the opposite of what he said he was going to do in the 30s. But the point is, that's what sin does. Sin will take your goal and will pervert it until your sin consumes you, and you end up serving your sin rather than it serving you. Now, I realize none of us are Hitler here, thankfully, right? I'm not trying to compare any of us to Hitler, but it's a good case study. It's a good analogy of what happens when you leave sin uh, unchecked. Um, and Paul actually speaks about this for in uh, 29 through 32. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They were filled with envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, they are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know that God's righteous decree that those who practice such things should die, they not only do them, but they encourage others to do them. As we said before, the bad news is, we're all born into this path of death. In this passage, Paul is not describing especially bad men, but the innermost truth of us all as who we are in ourselves. Moral chaos has entered the entirety of human society. Why do we not see fit to acknowledge God? Because we've replaced him with an idol of self, and as such, we're given over to the power of sin. And sin is not a good master. It will work us in its service, progressively twisting our hearts to evil until there's nothing left to twist. We are created in the image of God. But when we turn away from God in the light of heaven and we decide to bear our own image, all those left is darkness and death. What can an image bearer do if it's not bearing the image of of the thing it was made. If an image, if a mirror tries to bear its own image, what is, what is, what is there? There's nothing. We need to be desperate for the gospel and desperate from sin. We're drowning in a storm of sin and all of our efforts to stay afloat by ourselves will do nothing but wear us out and tire our limbs. The gospel is a lifeline thrown from heaven to save us from this deluge of evil. 
We need to grasp it and hold it tight. And this is where the good news comes in. The gospel is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel from faith to faith. Just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. And here we have a bit of an advantage over Habakkuk. Habakkuk could trust in this future salvation, but uh, being after Christ, having a better, clearer depiction, depiction of this future salvation, we know that we're not alone. Christ said that he would be with his disciples to the ends of the earth. And furthermore, he said that he'd send the helper, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, to help to be with us. There's, a, there's something in theology called already and not yet. So, we have not yet reached the full culmination of this path of life. That will be when, when Christ comes and we're all raised from the dead and live with him for a thousand, thousand years. But, we already, in this life, have the Holy Spirit. We already have a deposit of faith. We're already actively being conformed to the image of Christ. So in the future, whenever, when you leave here today, and you're going out maybe you're coming home from work and your family's, everyone's yelling and it's kind of frustrating because you're tired. Or maybe you're in school. I don't know how it is with, with other schools, but at uh, DTS, all of our exams are now online. Um, and a question comes up and you know where it is in the book and you know you probably should know it. And it'd just be easy just to cheat. Or maybe, yeah. Next time something sharp comes into your mind to rebuke somebody, I want you to stop. I want you to see a path of life and a path of death. And I want you to choose life. Um, There's actually a good passage that Paul writes later in the book of Romans uh, that I think would be great to end on. Um, it's Romans 13, 11, if you wanted to turn there. And do this... Because we know that the time is already the hour for us to awake from sleep. For our salvation is now nearer than when we first became believers. The night has advanced towards the dawn. The day is near. So we must lay aside the works of darkness and put on the weapons of light. Let us live decently as in the daytime. Not carousing and drunkenness not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in discord and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh or arouse desire. Let us live as if Christ is already here. Let us live by faith in that trust that we have been given. close with a prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here and worship you, Lord, and to participate together, Lord, communally in communion. Thank you, Lord, for your grace in giving us life even though we we're born into the way of death. Lord, we ask that you Send your Holy Spirit with us and help us to every day to choose you, Lord, and to put on Jesus Christ. We ask and pray all this in the name of thine Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.